Hello everybody and welcome to the HR Strategic Insight session on our recent uh, HR survey, the evolution of learning and how it is driving business success. So some of you may know that we've invited over 450 organisations, um, specifically their talent and HR and learning uh, functions to kind of give us an insight really into what's going on in the organisation. Um, so it was a really interesting data set that we were able to pull out from these 450 plus organisations that we are either working with or talking to. Uh, and today we really wanted to make more sense of that from an L&D practitioner's perspective, you know, kind of digging into the data, really trying to understand what does it mean to us in the L&D industry? What does it mean to the people that we're responsible for and look after in our organisation? And I'm delighted to say that today's conversation, I'm joined by Laura Walker, who's our lead associate consultant and learning solution architect at Hemsley Fraser, and Duncan Barrett, who's head of products uh, at Five App, our, our strategic partner for our platform and hub. So um, if I can, I'll come to you first, Laura. I mean, the survey covered a lot of ground, right? And asked a lot of questions. Was there any key themes that emerged for you from the data set? It did, yes. Um, there were three clear themes, um, particularly from an L&D practitioner and implications point of view. The first is a revolution in the how we're offering learning. Not surprisingly, digital dominated. And that obviously provides some opportunities and some challenges for L&D and HR functions. Many people reviewing their systems, two thirds reviewed their technology solutions in 2020 alone, which is a significant upshift. And obviously in terms of the things that are being offered to learners, huge change. So a revolution in the how, um, not surprisingly, with an emphasis on digital. The second area was um, really around future skills and skills gaps. The skills gaps have been around forever. We talk about them all the time as L&D professionals. But what shifted this year was more around the <clears throat> intensification of certain skills gaps. So in certain sectors, there was acute shortages in certain places, but also the notion that skills gaps are just going to become more and more of a, an issue as we're working longer, as people are going to have to reskill and upskill throughout their careers. That became a really dominant um, theme as well. And that has implications, obviously, for us as L&D professionals in terms of how we support that upskilling and that reskilling agenda, as well as filling those niche gaps. And then the third one was really more of a, a general cultural shift towards more of an agile learning culture. So because of the uncertainty in the market and in business in general, but also in terms of this need to continually learn and reinvent ourselves as individuals, a, a multifaceted challenge has emerged around how do you create the conditions for that agile learning culture? And it's not easy. So a lot of businesses and a lot of the respondents in the survey are still very early in the stages of defining what that means. So 42% are still just defining the scope of what that means. Some are in the process of starting to implement things and only 5% have completed that journey. So the majority of L&D professionals are wrestling with the, this challenge around how do you create that learning agility um, over time. So three clear messages there. Thanks, Matthew. Thanks, Laura. I, I, and I think you know, it's fasc fascinating insight when you think about you know the the scale of the challenge in front of the L and D uh, community and the organisations that they're supporting. Um, I think we're it's it's becoming quite clear that we're in unprecedented times as far as change is going on within the L and D function, the nature of learning, the way people want to and need to learn. Um, Duncan, I'll, I'll come to you. Um, just digging into one of those sort of key themes that Laura's pulled out, um, particularly around the skills gap. You know, putting your technology hat on. How do you think about that from a sort of product perspective, and how do you think about that when you think about how technology can address that? Yeah. So, uh, you know, I think all of the findings on the survey really stimulate a lot of reflection and, and consideration about how we serve that R&D talent and broader HR community. But the skills one's particularly interesting because you know, we know that technology is only part of part of that. You know, it's an enabler to it, but it's also a hugely complex problem in terms of 
you know, how does an organization at scale, you know, really understand the capabilities it has now, the capabilities it needs in the future, how best to deliver that, um, you know, what, how to measure that as well. So, you know, I think there is, uh, you know, as, as Laura's already kind of referred to, you know, L&D, I think, have always been focused on skills. And there's a little bit of a danger at the moment, I think, of, you know, skills being kind of hijacked by technology marketing as a, you know, as a, as a term that becomes very gener general and we tend to talk about learners very homogeneous, homogeneously. But we know that this is a complex issue. And really, I think as a technology provider, we want to focus on a part of that problem sometimes, not necessarily the whole problem. So yeah, we, we've always been very focused on what I call the kind of last mile. So connecting people to the content or content to the people to make sure that organizations can reach the people they need to with what it is they're trying to, to say. Mm. And with that in mind, what do you think is important on that theme, Laura, with regards to when an organization has to look at its um, ability to improve skills within existing or future employees? What do you think are the main issues that they're trying to address which weren't there previously or what's changed? I think one of the key issues is, is just the general ambiguity around business and defining what the future skills are is difficult because, of course, you know, we, we, nobody anticipated what was going to happen in 2020. So that made it difficult to define what those skills are. Um, and a lot of organisations do need quite similar skills. I mean, a lot of the organisations that I've worked with, we all talk about, you know, digital skills or we talk about customer service or whatever it is. But obviously the nuances around defining future skills is is important. And I think the other thing is around keeping that refresh going. So as we're working longer, so the number of people who are going to be working into their 60s and even potentially into their 70s, if you look at the data, is radically increasing. And at the same time, the lifespan of a skill set is decreasing. So the current estimates are that any skill will last for about five years. So you can work out how many times we're going to have to reskill and upskill as individuals and also um, as L&D functions to make that happen. So there's something around how we go about defining the skills, but also how we respond to those skills development needs and big, heavy programs with lots of accreditation, for example, probably isn't going to be fitting the bill. It needs to be more engaging, um, more responsive, more able to be refreshed than it has ever before. Mm -hmm. and, and with that in mind and this kind of necessity to keep that reskilling process flowing through a, a, a learning kind of a journey of an employee, how is the agility thing changing as well? You know, what are the key ingredients to having an agile LND function, would you say? Um, I mean, I think agility is, is a multifaceted challenge. And um, this is why we talk about an agile learning culture. Um, and I think that's where it is, it is. It is quite complex, but you need to start somewhere. So it's one of those, you, you create the conditions and create a shift. So I think that there's something at every level. So, that, and I think that's that's what we need to wrestle with as, a, as functions, um, is what happens at the executive level, what happens at functional leader level, what happens at manager level, and what happens at an individual level. And I think there's, uh, okay, that's a levelist approach, but there's also different elements to it as well. So about how we learn, when we learn, where we learn, all of those sorts of things is, is, is quite a, a fascinating um, and complex picture. And it's how we avoid getting sort of bogged down and stuck in that mm. complexity. It is about how do you cut through that and make a start um, and it, that has to come back to the, the sweet spot between the business agenda and being really clear about what those future skills are, but also the individual agenda. So if we can be clear about what they are, individuals can also make choices about their future employability by developing the skills that organisations need yeah, going that, forward. And I think the how, the where and the when is a really sort of an interesting and important point. And you also think within the context of what L&D are being asked to deliver to an organisation, I think the nature of what types of content people are consuming and what type of content the L&D function are pushing out is sort of shifting as well, slightly away from the formal kind of 
traditional skills we've always had to do the kind of the skill the, the competency mm-hmm. around technical skills soft skills leadership skills that's kind of always been there to a degree but this kind of emergence of uh, diversity and inclusion you know kind of a whole concept of dealing with ambiguity getting people to be able to communicate more in a storytelling style, uh, style. so I think we are seeing quite a shift in the time type mm-hmm. of content uh, that organizations are uh, needing and asking for Duncan you know from your perspective at, from five app and the hub you know we know this is important so how do you think about that again from just again from sort of technology well, perspective well, that's kind of Laura's alluded to there, you know, uh, agile learning, agile learning culture you know, is really about a, a kind of shift in, in kind of mindset and a, a shift in approach and, you know, to something that's much more around cont- continuous improvement, you know, being able to uh, quickly test and, and learn and experiment with, you know, different, uh, different content, different ways of uh, providing that experience to people. So, you know, we, we always think about, uh, the hub is something that you know has to be flexible enough to meet those sort of changing needs and and be you know super easy not just to uh, to the end user the person who's actually you know consuming and receiving a lot of this you know great information resources but also for the people that are tasked with very quickly being able to uh, to get something out and and uh, and uh, connect with those uh, those people as well. So yeah, definitely something that you know is a shift to thinking about you know much more ongoing form of communication rather than you know here's just a self service library go and fill your boots. Yeah, I think to that point as well. It, it, again, in this evolving landscape of what L and D is there to do and how it needs to do it, I think this kind of idea of communication. And the ease of access to content uh, and mm-hmm. information is going to be critical moving forward. Again, it just supports that agility that's required in an organisation. And I know you guys are doing a lot to try and make that end user experience as simple and as easy to sort of navigate as possible, um, particularly within the context of traditional learning management systems and so forth. Um, with that in mind, and we'll come, come to back to that uh, point that Laura made earlier about the revolution in the how, what are we seeing kind of emerge out of this, out of these sort of themes that's really important? Well, I think there's, there's been a lot of focus, um, you know, as Laura uh, as Laura's already said, you know, one of the survey findings around, you know, two thirds of, of, you know, organizations had reviewed their technology. You know, in my conversations, a lot of that f- discussion is around the delivery, you know, which is obviously an important shift and is a shift that, you know, needed to happen and, and has, has has happened. But I think actually the the opportunity for technology and how technology might help learning and development in an organization, I think goes well beyond just the delivery mechanism. You know, there's definitely, you know, mm-hmm. much more opportunity around automation. How do we reduce the time that is, you know, is spent on kind of manual interventions across, you know, L&D talent and, and HR? Um, you know, as well as, of course, the experience itself. How do we make the experience of someone in work feel more connected and more relevant? And, you know, I think there has been a tendency in a lot of organisations to, you know, think of the technical technology solutions they bring in as being, you know, for very specific purposes. You know, so, you know, you, you, you might often find a, a learning management system and a, an intranet you know, existing in the same organization, but trying to do very similar things in terms of connecting people to, you know, some of the why that is behind that in terms of the organization. And, uh, you know, I think there is an opportunity, you know, for, for L&D as well as the broader talent and HR functions as well to kind of really put the lens on you know, what it's like to be a person in that organization trying to navigate you know, the complexity of the, the tools and systems that they're being asked uh, to, to navigate. Mm. And Laura, what do you, would you agree with what Duncan's just said or have a slightly different opinion? Yeah, no, I, I would. I mean, I think technology is an enabler, so I think we're completely um, agreed on that. I mean, obviously, it can be content as well, but I think as a, as a core enabler and from a, an L&D practitioner point of view, I think it is around how do you get the balance across those the three E's, 
that you always have to pay attention to. So the effectiveness, so does it deliver the solution that we need it to? The efficiency, so that could be around time and effort, as well as you know how quickly you can provide a learning solution, but also the experience. And if it isn't a good experience, and if things don't talk to each other, which is often a challenge in organisations, is that interoperability between websites and LMSs, as you just explained, you know, that kind of navigation process can be can be pretty hideous. Um, so trying to cut through that and make it easy for learners to do what we want them to do. Because <laughs> we're all on the same page, really. We all want that learning to happen. Um, but it is about how do you make it engaging? How do you make it exciting, you know, topics that people want to learn about? But also how do you make sure that the, the technology helps people to to actually apply the learning, because obviously that's the bit that matters. And, and that's one of the things I do like about the, you know, the Hemsley Fraser approach around Excite, Engage, Embed. And that feeds through all the products that I've seen uh, and experienced so far, um, which is really critical from an L&D practitioner point of view. Great. Well, we could discuss this all day, but I think that's been a really useful conversation just summarising some of those key themes. Um, thank you both ever so much for your time and uh, look forward to speaking to you both again soon.